judge, but bring mercy. Take heed, watch and pray. And then they talk about the times of the day and the four watches, and they're usually divided up into three hour increments. And the Last Supper takes place during that evening watch. And then that phrase, he took bread and blessed it. They'll talk about the other times that we've looked at, heard that phrase in our study of Mark. And then Old Testament kings compared with Jesus. So we'll have those things in mind as we watch this. And then we'll talk about it afterwards. Jar of ointment, 
Uh, even the alabaster jar is very expensive and precious, which tells you that the contents are very expensive. Very expensive. A jar of ointment of pure nard, very costly. And she broke the jar and poured it over his head. But there were some there who said to themselves indignantly, Why was this ointment thus wasted? For this ointment might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they reproached her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing for me. I love that Greek word, kalon, which means, it means beautiful and noble. Um, and that was one of Mother Teresa of Calcutta's favorite verses. She would invite people to do something beautiful for the Lord. She wanted to imitate this woman. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you will, you can do good to them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. Right? And then goes on, truly I say to you, when it, wherever the gospel is preached, in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her, even in Denver. Right? So uh, she has done something beautiful and noble. So what we have is, is two women. One who gives her last penny, another who gives it very costly, and she breaks open the al alabaster jar. In other words, she's not going to hold any back. What a beautiful gift. That kind of giving to Jesus, we hold nothing back. You risk it all. And that's what this woman does for Jesus. So in a sense, we have a contrast of two women and two gifts and two temples. On the one hand, we have a widow who's giving her last penny to a temple that's bankrupt and about to be destroyed, as we're going to hear. And on the other hand, we have a woman who gives a very costly ointment, right, of pure nard. She breaks open to anoint Jesus' body for burial. But that's not a waste, because Jesus will rise from the dead. And her gift to this enduring, lasting Lord, this enduring, lasting new temple, will be preached and proclaimed throughout the world in memory of her, for what she did in honor of Jesus. It's a beautiful contrast. And again, we see this kind of Markin pattern where he sandwiches in between something. So the discourse against the temple that he's going to give in the Mount of Olives is sandwiched in between the, the widow and this other woman. Two gifts, two temples, and in between, we hear the end of the temple. So let's look at that briefly in chapter 13. Now this is tempting for me. This is the heart of my dissertation. So uh, I'm, uh, I could easily spend a 13 to 12, I could do a 12 part series just on this chapter. But don't worry, I won't. Um, at least I hope I won't. Uh, I'll be able to be brief here. But as they came out of the temple, one of the disciples said, And look, Rabbi, what wonderful stones, what wonderful buildings. Now, the temple complex that Herod the Great had built was over a 31-acre campus. It wasn't just one building. It was a, a series of buildings. It was stunning. Herod had these gorgeous stones in these buildings. And maybe you see some of this when you look at the Wailing Wall today. And the Wailing Wall was just the retaining wall for the 31-acre campus. Those beautiful big Roman stones you see at the bottom, they weren't any of the temple buildings. Those were even nicer stones. What you see on the Wailing Wall is simply the wall that's the retaining to hold the dirt for the 31-acre campus up above, where the buildings were that were so beautiful. It was a great wonder, one of the wonders of the world, and spectacular. And Jesus' disciples are speaking in awe and wonder at these great buildings, the great temple. And Jesus responds, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now, sometimes when people see pictures of the Wailing Wall, they're like, wait a minute, there's, well, there's still stones on top of each other. They were buried under the ground. That's the retaining wall. Jesus talked about the buildings on that campus. All those temple buildings were destroyed and dissembled by the Romans. The Romans were so upset with the Jews in their revolt that Titus orders the Romans to destroy and burn the temple, destroy it, but they also to dissemble it stone by stone and to throw all the stones off the top. And that's what the Romans do. Jesus' words were astonishingly literally fulfilled. And who could have predicted that? Then in verse 3, and then he sat on the Mount of Olives, opposite, literally over and against the temple. 
So on the Mount of Olives, you can look down on the Temple Mount. And then Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign when these things are all to be accomplished? I mean, the idea that the temple is going to be destroyed, that's a really, really, really big deal. And so they're like, what's the sign of this happening? And now we get the eschatological discourse. But remember, this is Jesus' answer is to the question of when the temple will be destroyed, not the end of the world. Keep that in mind. Now, Jesus is going to say some things that are going to sound like the end of the world, and that's going to cause a great problem for some people. And I'm going to just jump right to those problematic verses right away. And if you look at verse 24 of chapter 13, But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from the heavens, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with the great power and glory. And then he will send his angels out to gather his elect from the four winds, and from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Wow. That sounds like the end of the world, doesn't it? So this becomes a problem because what is going to follow from this, right? Uh, from the fig tree, verse 20, well, it's blessed. as soon as its branches become tender and it puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near, at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. Now, that sounds like Jesus thought the end of the world was going to happen within his lifetime, or shortly thereafter. And this is something that caused great consternation and problems theologically in the 18th and 19th century. And in the 19th century, this became what was known in French as the biblical question. And the a lot of the top Protestant scholars started to lose their faith. Well, Jesus can't really be divine because he thought and predicted that the world was going to end within a generation. And it didn't. We're still here. Which means Jesus is wrong. And if you're wrong, that means you're not divine. So Jesus was a great human teacher, and he was a really nice guy, but he wasn't God. That became the dominant movement in Protestantism, which led to the dominant movement in Protestantism called liberal Protestantism. Where liberal, the liberal Protestant movement in Europe was the idea that Jesus wasn't divine, and that the Bible couldn't be fully inspired and inerrant because it had an error. Jesus is there. So the Bible is a nice source, and Jesus is a good teacher, but he's not God. Which is the exact opposite of Mark's whole thesis, right? Of Mark's whole gospel. So how do we solve this problem? That's a real problem. With all these things, if he would have said some of these things, you know, okay. But Jesus says, all these things will take place before this generation passes away. And a generation for the Jews is 40 years. Remember the generation in the wilderness? Was there for 40 years. The generation is 40 years. So we got a 40 year span for the end of the world. For the sun to be darkened and the stars to be falling out of the skies. So either Jesus is right or he was wrong. He's either divine or a really nice guy. But a wrong guy. About the end of the world. Now, after the liberal Protestantism was going this way, it was causing a crisis in Europe of faith. And this was kind of the fruit of the Enlightenment. And the top Catholic theologian and scholar from France at the University of Paris, which is the top university for Catholics, Father Alfred Lauzy decided, all right, the Protestants have fallen here. And that's what, by the way, led to the fundamentalist movement, and going back to the fundamentals of Jesus' divinity, the inspiration and inerrancy of scripture, and other such things. So that reaction came to the mainstream Protestant scholarly opinion that Jesus wasn't divine. That's what led to the fundamentalist movement uh, in the 19th century, which really took root in the United States, especially amongst American Protestants. So Father Alfred Lozzi comes in to save us today. He studies this problem, and he can't get over the fact that Jesus said, within a generation, all this would happen, and the sun, the moon, and the stars would, would, would be darkened and fallen, and the Son of Man would come, and it would be the final judgment, and he's like, Jesus is wrong. So Father Alfred Lozzi starts teaching this to seminarians in Paris, and the Pope gets wind of it, Pope Leo the Thirteenth, and the Pope writes an encyclical. You know you're in trouble when you get an encyclical in response. And the encyclical is called Providentissimus Deus, on the providence of God. And in that encyclical, the Pope reaffirms that scripture is inerrant and is fully inspired. 
in that Jesus would speak and use human metaphors, and the scriptures will use human metaphors, but we have to understand those metaphors and understand within the scriptures and understand within the teaching of the church fathers, lest we mistake Jesus and the scriptures and think that there's errors. And he said that would be wrong. And then the Pope wrote Father Alphabazi a personal letter asking him to no longer teach scripture and to go back to pastoral work for the sake of his salvation. Father Alphabazi took a letter from his father, he threw it aside and said no. He continued to teach, he was excommunicated, he left the church, he died a very lonely, bitter man. It's a very tragic story. What Father Alfred Loisi didn't know is how to read the story of Jesus in light of the story of Israel. Because Jesus, when he says in verse 24, In those days the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from the heavens, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Jesus is quoting a passage in Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 13. And Jesus is not talking about the end of space and time. And I'll show that to you in several ways. But the first way is the first use of that very passage. In Isaiah 13, it's an oracle in verse 1 of Isaiah concerning Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw. And it begins with, raise a signal on a bare hill, which is the fire of life. Being lit on a signal hill means an enemy army is approaching. So it's a warning to Babylon. An army is going to come and crush them. There will be atonement in verse 4. And it's... Uh, and they're coming from a distant land in verse 5. Verse 6, wail, for the day of the Lord is near. And this is the day of judgment for Babylon. Babylon was ruthless in how they treated Israel. And they profaned the temple. And you remember how they drank from the vessels of the temple and all that? So God is foretelling the doom upon Babylon for their wickedness. And that, that day of the Lord is, is ultimately the day of God's judgment on Babylon. Therefore, all hands will be feeble. Every man's heart will melt. They will be dismayed. Pains and agony will seize them like a woman in travail, in tribulation, as she's in labor pains. That will be an image Jesus uses, by the way, in chapter 13 of Mark. They will look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the earth, or literally, it should be translated land, a desolation, and to destroy sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising. The moon will not shed its light. I will punish the land for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will put an end to the pride of the arrogant and lay low the haughtiness of the ruthless. And I will make men more rare than fine gold and, and, and uh, mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath, at the fierce anger, at the day of the Lord. Now did Isaiah believe that that was going to be the end of space and time? No. What he believed was going to be the end kingdom of Babylon. And it was. So the sun, the moon, and the stars being darkened, that, my friends, is how ancient people kept in time. They didn't have iPhones and iWatches and watches and Rolexes. They kept time by the sun, the moon, and the stars. The sun for the hour, the moon for the cycle of the weeks and the month, and the constellations for the seasons. And so the sun, the moon, and stars being darkened is a metaphor saying to Babylon, your time is up. Your kingdom is coming to an end. The, your time is at hand for judgment. You better repent. That is what that means. It's prophetic metaphors. We use this kind of language to describe major life-changing and cultural changing events. If I speak about Black Friday, what am I referring to? The, what, the, the stock market crash, right? Right. So when the stock market crashed, it was it was it was called Black Friday in the papers. Was there an eclipse? If you go back historically and look, was there a solar eclipse and no one could see anything in Manhattan? No. But it was a dark day, not because of the literal amount of sunlight, but because of the events that transpired that would bring ruin to many and chaos for the country with the collapse of the stock market. Go back to the financial meltdown, as we talked about it, right? Uh, the Great Recession. And when that was happening, apocalyptic language was used, right? We called it the financial meltdown. Was there so much heat that, you know, that coins were melting? No. No, but we use 
highly charged metaphors to talk about significant life-changing events. And so the irony is, Father Lozi and many of those Protestant scholars were taking the Bible in a flat wooden, wooden literalistic manner. And if we can't take the Bible literalistically, we have to read it literarily. What does the author intend? Jesus intends to allude to the story of Babylon being judged. He's saying that there's a judgment coming to this generation, and they better repent and be prepared. That's what he's saying. And that's why when you go into the passages, uh, for example, in verse 14, it says, When you see the desolating sacrilege set up where it ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Well, what good, if this is the end of space and time, what good, what good does it do to flee to the mountains? Right? Of course this is not the end of space and time. He's saying, flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down. Let him enter the house and take anything away. Uh, and he says, uh, you know, hopefully this, pray that this doesn't happen during winter. He goes on to say. Well, what difference does it make if this is winter or summer, if it's in a space and time? Well, in winter, the Jordan River floods, and you can't cross over. And what happens is, when this does happen, many, especially the Christians, according to the first church historian Eusebius, will flee and go to Jordan. And they'll flee Jerusalem, and they'll be spared this destruction, because they know Jesus' prophecy. That's why it's important that it happen in winter. But again, who cares if it's winter? if this is the end of space and time. And that idea of winter, by the way, is in verse 18. Pray that it may not happen in winter. So that doesn't make any sense. So Jesus is clearly not saying that this is the end of space and time. What he's saying is this is the end of Jerusalem and the regime of Israel and the temple. And exactly, and he says this what happened within a generation and 40 years to the day. Jesus is crucified in the year 30 AD and 70 AD the temple and Jerusalem is destroyed by the Romans. And the Jews revolt from Rome in the year 66 AD, and it takes the Romans four years because there's a civil war in Rome that breaks out and causes Rome to be burned down, which is Nero's, you know, uh, which is going to lead to other things. Uh, but in that midst of all that tribulation, Jerusalem is burned down and the temple is utterly destroyed, just as Jesus predicted. And Father Lozi lost faith because he understood the words of Jesus without understanding the context of those words and how that context was referring to other texts in the scriptures of Israel, like Isaiah 13 and many other passages. But there's a lot more to that, but that was what my dissertation was on. So if you want more, you can go to my referee to my dissertation on Jesus in the temple in the Gospel of Mark. Now, I want to pick up uh, verse 32 that sets up a very important part of the passion narrative here. In chapter 13, verse 32, Jesus gives a parable. Of that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now that will bother people, right? Jesus doesn't know when that day, when that hour is going to be. He's the Son. Well, keep thinking about that. Let that bother you for a while. Take heed, which literally, you get to take heed in verse 9, and other verses, it's repeated. Uh, lepe in the Greek, it means to watch. Watch out, watch out. And I like it in the beginning of, of the two discourses of Jesus. I told you were Mark 4 and Mark 13. In Mark 4, Jesus keeps saying, listen, listen. Here, he says, watch, watch. And in between, we've heard about people being deaf and blind. So here the summons is to watch, to look for the signs, to read them rightly. So we should watch out for the signs. So much to teach on this, and let's see if I can. All right, so Jesus goes on and says, Watch therefore, take heed, watch, and pray. For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and he commands the doorkeeper to be on watch. Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. In the evening, or at midnight, or at cockroach, or in the morning. Lest he come suddenly and find you asleep, what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Watch. Now, obviously, Jesus is thinking something's at hand soon. Now, what we're told next is it was now two days before the Passover, and the feast of the leavened bread was at hand. 
which is which is the means of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes are seeking how to arrest him, which is what he talks about in verse nine through thirteen about being arrested, and handed over, tortured, and other things. And so, uh, what happens next is I want to drop us to from chapter fourteen to verse seventeen. And notice the little marker. Mark is more particular in detail than any of the gospel writers with the detail, especially with time frame. And what he says in chapter 14, verse 17, it says, And when it was evening, now it's the time of the Passover, when it was evening, he came with his twelve. And as they were at table eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will hand me over, betray me. One who is eating with me. Now, of course, what time is it? Evening. Now, remember, what are the four watches? The four watches that Jesus gives the disciples at the end of chapter 13 is... And the master will come, be ready, because it could be at evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at morning. Those are the four watches that compose 12 hours of the night watch for the Romans. Evening begins at 6 p.m. And goes until 9 p.m. That's the evening watch, those three hours. And then the midnight watch is you're watching for midnight, and you're on guard from 9 until midnight. And then cockrow is from midnight to 3 a.m. You're uh, waiting for the cockrow early in the morning. And then from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., you're on the watch for the morning. And it ends with 6 a.m. when the sun rises. You're on watch for morning, just as you're on watch for midnight from 9 to midnight. Those are the hours. That is going to be the structure Mark gives us for the Passion narrative. So the Passion of Jesus will take place during these watches. So evening is the Last Supper. And Jesus will be eating, and he will take his, his uh, he will take the bread off of the Passover. Now that meal has so much theological and meaning, and depth of meaning. I'm not going to cover it in this study because we don't have time. But we have a beautiful study called Presence on the meaning of the Eucharist and Jesus' meal. And we could cover a lot of that beautiful meaning here at the Last Supper at that event, but I want to just follow from the passion narrative, and I want to pick up a couple things here. Uh, so Jesus, at the Last Supper, he takes the bread, he blesses, he breaks, and he gives. The same four verbs we saw before. The importance of the bread for Mark is, is very important. Now, the idea of taking, that's important, and that gets back to the heart of kingship in the Old Testament, and that's the heart of Jesus' kingship. Now, the first king main king in Israel is who? Saul. And when Israel comes to the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 8, and they say to the prophet, make us a king. We want a king like all the other nations. Samuel's depressed. He goes and prays about it, and God says, get over it, Samuel. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me from being the king over them. But God, and this is always a great way of punishing, uh, Parents will sometimes do this. So sometimes the best punishment is letting them have their own way. Right? And uh, God will let Israel have their own way. That will be his punishment. But he warns Samuel, he says, tell the people this. When you have a king, he gives a speech in chapter 8 of 1 Samuel. It's very important. When you have a king, here's what he's going to do. He's going to take your sons. He's going to take your daughters. He's going to use them. He's going to take your crops. He's going to take a tithe of your, of your fruit. He's going to take your sheep and goats. He's going to take, take, take. That's what the kings do. You will end up not with a foreign tyrant, but with your own tyrant from within. That's what the kings will do. They will take, take. And of course, we see this with the kings of Israel. Israel, Even David takes another man's wife, Bathsheba, for himself. In selfishness, the kings take, which will lead to the civil war that leads to the division of the kingdom, and it will lead to the fall of the kingdom, because the kings end up being greedy, and they take and they take. Jesus doesn't take like those other kings. Jesus does the opposite. What Jesus does is he takes the bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, and he gives it to them. And he commands us, and think about this every Mass, every time you gather for Eucharist, Jesus takes the bread, and he asks and invites us, take this and eat of it, all of you. That's what he says here in verse 22. And he gave it to them, and he said, take, this is my body. When Jesus says, this is my body, he's gone. When he said, let there be light, there was light. When he says, this is my body, 
It is his body. It becomes his body and his life. And he is truly present. But then he asks us to take from him. To eat from him. Jesus is the king who not takes from, the, from us. He takes himself and he makes himself a gift to us. That's the kind of kingship he has. His kingship is different from the Lord's and from the Gentiles. He takes himself and everything he has and he gives it to us. That would be the heart of his passion. But it won't be at the evening watch that the hour strikes. We're still looking for the hour. And we'll follow that through the rest of the passion narrative in our next episode.
actually refers to his wife. And Ham has raped his mother and has a son, Canaan, who later on is going to be, you know, the founder of the Canaanites. That's why the Jews are supposed to go into the promised land and remove the Canaanites. So it, uh, and there's a whole phrase in, like I say, Leviticus 18, uh, they'll use that phrase over and over again about uncovering nakedness in relationship to uh, sexual acts that are not supposed to be taking place. You know, between brother and sister and the aunts and so forth and on and on. Yeah. No, no, that's yeah. not not the birth right now. That, that's another story. <laughs> Excommunication is usually 
she's not, she is not only uh, it's giving out of her surplus, but she's not trying to impress anybody else. You know, it's really uh, what she can give to God. That's, that's her focus, not impressing anybody else. Yeah, literally, not letting the right hand know what the left is doing. We talked about Father Boise seeming contradictions in scripture which lead to a loss of faith. What should we do when we encounter fasting? Well, we talked a little bit about that, taking scripture in its totality. When we were studying scripture last spring, we talked about that in scripture in light of the rest of scripture in Old Testament in light of the New. Yeah, and there's also a lot of There's even an interpretation about the Last Supper that uh, alludes to the fact that uh, Jesus himself might have been influenced or, or shown uh, a light to the lightning to the Indian scene himself. Uh, on one hand, he never had anything to nice to say about the Sadducees. Now, Going back to Maccabees, they revolted against the Greeks because the Greeks were putting their own people in charge of the temple. The line from Aaron and uh, Zion was, was broken. They were putting all the people in there. They were putting you know, uh, uh, statues of Zeus in there and, and all sorts of things. And, and so the the Essenes themselves uh, we had no respect for the uh, the people that were running for the Sadducee that were running things, you know, the sacrificial priesthood in the temple. And uh, that seems to be carried over here with, with Jesus, with his attitude of you know cleansing all this, uh, you know, these money changers and everything else out of the temple and so forth. And so and others, they could kind of see that, yeah, he's uh, again kind of siding with uh, the Essenes here. And uh, anyway, there's all sorts of uh, findings uh, through uh, even archaeological findings of uh, they, they've dug up something that had David's name on it, uh, some relic or whatever. There's many. So that's becoming un unearthed too. So there's a lot more that we are learning all the time about uh, biblical studies and uh, just plain uh, understanding. I, I know when I was a, a young lad, uh, I had the ability to win. Now I've got a, a Bible here. In fact, I, I'm also have sent away for the Navarre Bible, which is even more filled up with with oh, explanations. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and that, that's a really, the uh, uh, Bibles are getting better because they, they're coming up with all these references and insights uh, that uh, mm -hmm. I never thought of before. Is there some significance about what part of Jerusalem the Athenians lived in? I don't know. Yeah, they say that there was a section and, um, uh, the area where the Last Supper was at might have, might have been in that area. Uh, they, they, there was a big one, of course, down right around the, what, uh, Qumran, down around the Dead Sea, where you know, John was there, uh, the Baptist. And uh, there was also something, I guess, they believe, up uh, around Jerusalem itself. Uh, but they never, they never went into the temple because they didn't believe Yeah. 
think they've established that as fact, but it's a good plausible theory. How is Jesus different from the past kings of Israel and Gentile kings? How does this understanding of Jesus as king impact our life?